we really think these uh, these modeling tools uh, can be used uh, into the future as a watershed management uh, tool to uh, evaluate individual projects, evaluate, um, uh, for example, you know, some sort of post-fire um, analysis. Uh, but it, these the the investment in these models is is such that it's expensive to put them together. But if you have a uh, with the existing model, with uh, if you have a, a question, if there's something that needs to be evaluated, it's much less expensive to evaluate that using the model once it exists. So we're we're, we're trying to have Coast Range Watershed Institute as a entity to make that model available in the future. Um, and we, uh, we built a little bit of this model on top of some prior grant funded work from the fisheries restoration grant program that we did with Pepperwood Foundation um, on, on Mill Creek and a couple of other tributaries of the Lower Russian. And that, that work also made uh, putting this model together, which is a little bit more sophisticated and involves a groundwater component, not just a surface water component. Um, and that, that project also developed a lot of habitat data uh, or, or gathered together a lot of existing habitat data that uh, Sea Grant and some others have, uh, have developed. So um, this is kind of a culmination of a, a fair amount of work we've done out there. Um, a, a lot of thanks to uh, Trout Unlimited and their, their team for uh, sharing hydrologic data and uh, providing access to gauge sites that they've been uh, working on for many years now uh, and allowing us to do uh, our winter gauging in the winter of 2018, 2019. Uh, thanks to the SOMA RCD for facilitating, administrating, coordinating at all levels of this thing. And I'm gonna hand this off to Jeremy Kobor here in a moment. Um, uh, he is unambiguously wearing the, uh, the O'Connor environmental hat um, in his role. Uh, he's been the lead modeler for this project and he's, he's been working on wrapping up the modeling aspects of this so that we can move on to producing the, the final report. Uh, and we're shooting to have that done uh, probably March of 2021. And so with that, I will introduce Jeremy. Oh, and, and just one other thing, um, Jeremy's presentation, uh, you, can, you can put uh, questions into the chat um, while he's talking. And if it's something I can answer, I will. If it's something that requires something more detailed that maybe I'm not familiar with, um, we'll, we'll hold that, but there'll be a break about halfway through Jeremy's presentation where we can do some, some, uh, some Q and A and then again at the end, and then we'll, tr we'll transition to the Trout Unlimited presentation. Okay, you're up, Jeremy. Okay, talk about the agenda for the presentation, uh, go over some of the project goals and the approach to our study talk about the development of the model we put together and some of the calibration results from that model. Uh, we'll describe the existing hydrologic conditions in the watershed, uh, put those in the context of salmonid habitat requirements and salmonid habitat uh, suitability. We'll talk about some of the scenarios we looked at focused on uh, strategies to enhance stream flow. And we'll finish up with some key findings and conclusions. So I think Matt mentioned at the beginning, this was a three-year study funded by WCB. Uh, the focus of the study was really on development of this numerical hydrologic model. Uh, we can see that as a model. We can also uh, think about it as a management tool. So it's a place where we can synthesize a lot of existing data and information about the watershed, uh, describe the hydrologic conditions and processes at play, and test out various what-if scenarios. Uh, to the effects um, of um, landscape and water use on uh, The other goals of the project were to use that model to predict the location and quantity of stream flow, uh, relate that to salmonid habitat requirements and uh, investigate how that varies with different climate conditions. Uh, look at the cumulative effects of land and water use decisions on stream flow. Prioritize reaches for uh, restoration based on flow availability, and then predict effectiveness of different strategies designed to maintain or enhance stream flow conditions, as well as investigate the impacts of uh, 
So the model we use is called Mike Chi. It's a distributed hydrologic model. Uh, it tries to take a pretty holistic look at the watershed, simulate all of the natural processes, as well as uh, many of the man-made influences and many of the feedbacks between different processes. It's a distributed hydrologic model, so it's built on a lot of spatial GIS information. Uh, this is just a simple slide giving you a flavor for some of the model inputs. Uh, it describes climate, things like precipitation and evapotranspiration. Uh, it has topography and a representation of the stream channel network and topography. Uh, it has a description of the land use and vegetation cover, uh, represents some of the uh, man-made influences in the watershed like surface water diversions, has an unsaturated component where it represents the soil distribution and properties. And it also represents the groundwater underlying the unsaturated soil zone, as well as the impact from uh, pumping wells. Give you a little bit more of an introduction to the watershed. Uh, we're looking at a watershed map showing the major sub watersheds. You can see the extent of the stream network we represented in our model. We've got uh, Main Stem Mill Creek running through the center there. We've got Palmer Creek uh, to the south, Wallace Creek to the north, and Felta Creek down there in the, the southeast. Um, also shown here is the uh, generalized geology in the watershed. Uh, most of the watershed shown in green there is uh, underlain by Franciscan complex. That's a pretty uh, hard rock geology. Most of the groundwater that occurs in the Franciscan uh, flows in fractures or secondary porosity. Um, it's a somewhat reliable source of water to wells, but um, you know, not a major aquifer. Pretty fairly limited uh, groundwater supply in Franciscan in general. Moving farther down the watershed, uh, we've got a limited outcrop of the Glen Ellen formation, which is sedimentary formation. And then we have some snow volcanics outcropping um, in the lower part of the reach. And those actually form an important uh, geomorphic control in the watershed. Uh, we have a reach of falls um, coincident with the snow volcanic bedrock control, very steep reach um, with gates. Um, uh, not a passage barrier, but uh, certainly a challenge for people. And then farthest down uh, to the east there in the lower watershed, we've got uh, alluvium and we have an alluvial aquifer that's very distinct and different from the rest of the upper watershed. Um, that's basically a little uh, section of the Dry Creek Valley uh, where Mill Creek comes into the valley and confluences with Dry Creek, the downstream end of the area. Uh, for a frame of reference, uh, this is West Side Road, which kind of cuts across the upper portion of the area. Uh, Christian will get into the monitoring that has been done in the lower watershed in a lot more detail, uh, but I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, we had 14 wells which we were able to monitor on uh, a monthly basis for um, about a year period. And we we're able to contour that data and get a feel for uh, the directions of groundwater flow. Uh, there's a pretty interesting pattern of groundwater flow here. We see a down gradient flow pattern in the upper portion of the alluvium. Um, as we move farther down to lower Mill Creek, we see that transition uh, to a different uh, dominant flow direction where we're really basically in the dry creek influence. So we've got essentially an alluvial fan uh, with relatively thin sedimentary deposits dominated by what's happening in Mill Creek up here, transitioning down to a much thicker regional alluvial aquifer dominated by Dry Creek primarily here. Um, we took a look at the subsurface geology through well completion reports uh, to get a feel for how the uh, subsurface in the alluvium varies both in thickness and character. Uh, what we see here is a cross section basically looking uh, downstream along Mill Creek and cutting across it there at one point. Uh, so on the uh, left side, you're up near the Felta confluence. On the right side, you're down by the Dry Creek confluence. As you can see, the thickness of the alluvium increases pretty dramatically in the downstream direction. Uh, if you look at the different colors in the well logs there, that indicates the proportions of fine versus coarse grain material. 
and that appears to increase pretty substantially in the downstream direction as well. We've got a fair amount of clay with some sand and gravel lenses in the upper portion. And as you move down towards Dry Creek, it becomes more dominated by uh, sand and gravel. Um, also shown are some groundwater elevation data from uh, water level measurements in these wells. And what you'll notice here is in the springtime, in the April time frame, uh, the stream is connected to the water table um, locally here. And as time progresses through the summer months, uh, the stream becomes disconnected, um, becomes a purely losing disconnected reach. The October 2018 water levels there, uh, substantially below the bed of the creek in the upper portion, and even more so as you move down toward the drain. So we did some calibration of our model. Uh, models really is only as good as um, the data you have behind it and the ability to calibrate it and validate it with real world data. Um, we've got some pretty good stream flow records here. We've got a two year record at a location above Wallace Creek um, where we performed most of our overall calibration. Um, we also had uh, two other gauges we worked with um, a little farther upstream at Bears Flat and then further downstream at above the falls. Those calibrations really focused on the May through September timeframe. Uh, most of our uh, flow concern in terms of some modern habitat is really centered on the spring and summer timeframe. So we focused our calibration effort on that time period as well. Pretty good representation of uh, base flow recession in the spring and then the summer. Uh, uh, we also had a fair amount of groundwater monitoring data. You can see our monthly measurement of uh, static water levels. Um, these it's at 14 wells, all in the lower alluvial reach. And we're able to do a pretty good job of reproducing the fluctuations in static water levels in our model as well. Some of the locations uh, better than others, as you might expect. Uh, some tendency to underpredict groundwater elevations, but um, in many cases, we're, we're on. Uh, moving into some of the modeling results, we spent a fair amount of time on the water use component of the uh, water balance. So thinking about the man-made influences, uh, we looked at the total water use in the watershed and found it was about 257 acre feet per year. On the chart on the left there, you can see how that breaks down in terms of the different use categories. Uh, the biggest use by far is vineyard irrigation. Uh, we have residential use about 13% and uh, frost protection, something like 11%. Um, and then some various other uses as well. We went through a pretty exhaustive effort to identify outdoor cannabis operations, uh, so as not to underestimate that component of the water use. However, it appears to be a pretty small component of total water use, like 1%. Uh, if we look at the breakdown of where that water is sourced on the right, we find that um, the majority of the water comes from groundwater, about 65%. Fairly substantial utilization of surface water in this watershed, around 27%. And we have a few parcels using recycled water from the Healdsburg treatment plant uh, for vineyard irrigation. And that adds up to about 8% of total water use. One of the primary outputs from a distributed model like this is an estimate of the water balance. So this tells us uh, the precipitation falling in the watershed, uh, where, what, what is the fate of that water? Uh, so we can divide that into inflows and outflows. And over time, those balance um, when you take into account any changes in storage. And what we're showing here is uh, for a 10-year simulation period, we've got the 10-year average conditions in gray. Uh, we've got the driest year in our simulation, 2014, shown in orange, and then the wettest, 2017, uh, shown in blue there. So really dramatic variations in rainfall, um, typical for a Mediterranean climate, but maybe even a little bit more extreme here in Mill Creek than other places locally. Something like a fourfold variation between a very dry year and a very wet year. 100 inches a year in a wet year, we've got very high rainfall here. Up in the um, if we look at the fate of that water, uh, a lot of it goes to actual advanced evapotranspiration, AET. That's water use by plants combined with evaporation. 
Uh, we can see that doesn't vary as much from year to year. Uh, the plants kind of are pretty good at, at getting their water regardless of, of how dry the conditions, or wet the conditions may be. Stream flow, on the other hand, does vary substantially. Uh, order of magnitude, more stream flow in a very wet year versus a very dry year. And then the far right there, you can see the um, modest changes in storage that happen. Um, we have a drought in a dry year, we see declines in storage. When we have a wet year, we see an increase in storage. Over time, in the 10 year average, fairly stable. Uh, we can also look at the water balance from the perspective of just the groundwater component. Uh, here, the main inflows are infiltration recharge and stream bed recharge. You see, infiltration recharge is by far the dominant component of total recharge. Uh, we have a small subsurface inflow, and that's basically flow moving down the Dry Creek Valley into our model domain. Uh, in terms of outflows, we've got a number of them. Um, most of these end up, uh, or the first three end up being stream flow. We can divide that into inner flow, base flow, and spring flow, uh, depending on how that water moves from the groundwater system to the streams. And another big outflow component is evapotranspiration from the groundwater. So this is where plants have their roots in the water table and are able to extract water directly from the saturated zone. Uh, you can see the groundwater pumping term is very small relative to these others. Um, there's uh, not a ton of, of groundwater development, at least in the upper watershed. Uh, we have a subsurface outflow term. That's flow moving down the Dry Creek Valley out of our domain. And then we have changes in storage that depend on water year. So that's kind of a global water budget for the whole uh, watershed. Of course, things vary spatially quite a bit. Uh, it's one of the advantages of having a distributed mm -hmm. model is we can look at that. Uh, so here we're looking at the groundwater recharge, and this is a 10-year um, average recharge. And we see uh, pretty high recharge rates overall in the upper watershed in that bedrock terrain. Uh, we've got something like 11 inches a year on average. Fair amount of spatial variability showing up in the model, and that's basically a function of topography. Um, we basically see uh, very low recharge rates uh, in the stream channel valley bottom areas where we have groundwater discharging and relatively high rates on ridge tops and hill slopes uh, where the water table is deeper and uh, we have a recharge uh, dominant situation going on. Um, Definitely a, a west to, to east precipitation gradient, but we don't see that uh, being a major driver of recharge here. Fairly high recharge overall um, everywhere um, if you do watershed averaging. And if we move down to the lower watershed, you can see those blues there in the alluvial terrain. Uh, very high recharge in the alluvial terrain. We're getting something like 23 inches a year um, average across that alluvial aquifer and even higher rates uh, on the margin of where the uh, valley bottom transitions into the hill slopes. And we have the Franciscan transitioning to um, alluvium, uh, kind of roughly corresponds to west. So we're mostly interested in stream flows. Uh, we use the model to characterize stream flows during a number of different time periods. This is looking at the spring time period, April through June. Uh, comparing a uh, rather dry year of 2014 on the top to a wet year like 2019 on the bottom. Uh, huge variations between a wet and a dry year. You can see uh, flows in the order of uh, one to two CFS in the middle and lower portions of the mill in a dry year, uh, ramping all the way up to you know 10 to 20 CFS in a wet year. So pretty dramatic fluctuations depending on uh, the timing of that spring. Rather. Moving on to summer discharges, this is looking at the average discharges during the July through September time frame. Uh, much less fluctuation between a dry versus a wet year, but still pretty substantial. Uh, we have something like a tenth to two tenths of a CFS in the middle portion of Mill Creek in the dry year, ramping up to uh, three to four tenths in the wet year. Uh, you'll also notice the lowest reach of Mill Creek goes very dry, especially in a dry year. Uh, the average discharge is uh, zero during that summer time frame uh, because it's dried out. Uh, fairly dry conditions in Wallace Creek as well. 
and uh, portions of Delta Creek. So discharge is important. Uh, when we're thinking about salmonid habitat, we're really more interested in uh, the connectivity between adjacent pool habitats and the uh, riffle depths uh, between those habitats. We can look at riffle depths in relation um, to, uh, or sorry, riffle depths in conjunction with flow disconnection. Uh, some of the work that Sea Grant has done has demonstrated that uh, when pools disconnect, in other words, surface flow over riffles goes to zero, uh, we start to get major water quality problems in adjacent pools, and that leads to significant mortality of salmonids. That disconnection is relatively short, something like less than two weeks, uh, maybe some fairly high survival rates in those adjacent pools. But if that disconnection um, extends any longer than about two weeks, we see significant mortality. Uh, so that's a really important metric here is whether we go to zero discharge over the riffles and whether that happens for a long period or a short period of time. And then of course, we'd like to remain connected ideally um, and see riffle depths on the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 feet. Um, so what we see here, when we look at the disconnection and riffle depths, uh, much of main stem Mill Creek remains connected. Um, there are a few short reaches that experience short-term disconnected disconnection in the middle of Mill Creek. The lower reach is extremely dry, disconnects for a long period of time, even in an average year. And we'll talk more about what that means for coho out migration in it. Uh, we also see that Palmer Creek retains pretty uh, good flow connection in the lower reach. Felta Creek, okay in the middle, but pretty dry in the lower and upper reaches. And Wallace Creek, really pretty dry throughout. Uh, taking a closer look at that out migration timing. So now we're looking at two locations in Mill Creek, uh, right below Felta Creek in the lower watershed and way down at the bottom end right above Dry Creek. Uh, what we see here are a couple vertical lines. These are indicating the timing of when uh, smolts out migrate from the watershed based on uh, Sea Grant monitoring data again. Uh, they found that in uh, a late year, about 80% of the out migrants had moved by the third week of May. And by the middle of June, about 99% of the out migrants had moved. Um, so ideally, we'd like to keep flows high enough that we have passable conditions through um, at least the 80% uh, time frame, if not the, the 99%. Um, I've indicated here in the horizontal line the flow required to maintain a minimum passage threshold, something like one CFS here below Felta Creek something like 0.7 feet as we move a little farther downstream. Uh, the rest of the lines here are the different water years among the 10 that we simulated. You'll see in wet and average years, uh, we're maintaining flows above that passage threshold well into the late June, July timeframe. But when we look at the dry years like 2014, 2015 in particular, you can see we're falling below that passage threshold as much as uh, three, four weeks prior to the, when we'd like to be able to maintain them to get all the smolts out of the watershed. Um, as we look at a comparison between the upper graph and the lower graph, basically moving downstream, you can see things shift two, three weeks earlier. So we're finding that flows disconnect at the very lowest end of the watershed, right above Dry Creek um, first. That's really the limiting factor for getting out migrants out of the watershed. And some of the wet dry mapping data that's available uh, confirms that finding as well. So we tried to synthesize all of this flow information to say, what does this mean for uh, salmonid habitat? Uh, we considered two primary flow periods or habitat life stages, uh, juvenile rearing habitat, here, uh, what we'd really like in terms of flow is to maintain summer base flows that are protective of water quality, uh, that can support uh, macroinvertebrates on which juvenile salmonids feed, and that will provide some resilience to potential changes coming down the road from climate change. Uh, we used a 0.2 foot riffle depth threshold as indicative of a minimum flow requirement, and there's quite a bit of field data and um, other observations behind that. 
Uh, we also looked at a smolt outmigration classification. Uh, here, the goal is to maintain passable flow conditions throughout the spring migration window. Uh, in particular, we're looking at that 80% outmigrant and 99% outmigrant uh, thresholds, basically the third week of May and the second week of June. Uh, we'd like to be able to uh, maintain flows high enough to allow outmigrants to uh, move out of the watershed throughout those periods. And winter rearing and spawning habitat are other important life stages. Uh, those weren't really the focus of this project, but we had an earlier project focused on winter rearing habitat. And there's quite a bit of data, um, habitat survey and biological monitoring information that can help us uh, get some handle on those life stages as well. So we set a number of flow criteria. These are centered around the desire to maintain that 0.2 foot riffle crust thaw leg depth, ideally continuously throughout the summer. Uh, so in order to achieve a score of seven here, you would need to maintain that target depth either throughout the summer in terms of juvenile rearing or throughout the out migration period in terms of small out migration. Uh, score of zero on the other hand, uh, means we're having long-term disconnection of stream flow in the summer, even during average year for juvenile rearing, and we're not really achieving possible flow conditions in that uh, key April June time frame, uh, really ever if you had a score of zero of migration. So the basic finding is that uh, many, you know, several of the criteria aren't met anywhere. So we're essentially flow limited um, in terms of juvenile rearing and smoke out migration habitat. Uh, we've got many of the criteria met in the middle and lower reaches of Mill Creek, uh, as many as five in terms of both criteria. Um, as we move into the lower watershed, you can see the juvenile rearing score zero in that lowest watershed. Um, we can also look at places like Wallace Creek, pretty limited for juvenile rearing, experiences disconnection of flow, um, lower felt well, similar situation. We took those two maps and combined them with some earlier work we did focused on classifying habitat based on winter rearing habitat. Um, and that's what you see here um, is a combination of the uh, three flow-related habitat classifications. And um, that allows us to basically understand what, is, what are the limiting factors in different portions of the watershed. Um, so if we look at uh, most of the middle and upper reaches of Mill Creek, that's really our core habitat, shown in blue, also a little bit in lower Palmer. Uh, so this is where we're uh, meeting many of our criteria for smolt out migration, juvenile rearing, and winter rearing. Uh, green are locations where we're meeting the uh, most of the flow criteria, but uh, winter habitat is a little more limited. And then the orange areas, uh, chief are uh, primarily Wallace Creek, are places where uh, we're meeting many of the other flow criteria, but we're uh, limited in terms of summer rearing flow, so very dry. Summer conditions are really the, the dominant limiting factor there. Uh, as we look at the lower watershed of uh, Felta and Mill, you can see um, very limited conditions in terms of both um, summer rearing and winter rearing. And I've also superimposed here some of the coho monitoring data that Sea Grant has performed, um, just showing locations where we have 10 or more coho that were observed in pools in that reach um, year after year. So it gives an idea of where um, coho utiliz are utilizing the stream uh, more or less. And a couple of patterns there, uh, you know, generally agrees with our classification. In the upper watershed, we see relatively high coho utilization in Middle Mill Creek and Lower Palmer Creek. Um, the question mark are all these coho here in Lower Mill and uh, right above the Felta Creek, or sorry, lower Felta and right above the Felta Creek confluence um, seem to be located in places that have pretty uh, severely limiting flow conditions, probably fairly low survival rates there. So to summarize what we found about the existing hydrology, springtime flows vary pretty substantially from year to year. 
Uh, we have pretty low but relatively consistent summer base flow in much of Mill Creek and lower Palmer Creek. But we do see frequent pool disconnection in the lowest reaches of Mill Creek, short reaches in the middle of Mill Creek, much of Wallace Creek and much of Felta Creek. In terms of the water budget, we saw relatively high recharge rates throughout the upper bedrock terrain uh, with much of that variability from location to co location controlled by topography rather than position in the watershed. A very high recharge rates in that lower alluvial watershed. In terms of water use, relatively high reliance on surface water resources here compared to some of the other watersheds in the Russian River, something like 27% of the total use coming from surface water. We found that vineyard irrigation and frost protection are the dominant uses, accounting for roughly three quarters of the total use. Uh, annual groundwater pumping is uh, really relatively small when we compare that to the total recharge, especially in the upper bedrock terrain, less than 1%. Uh, if we look just at that lower alluvial aquifer, that's really where a lot of the pumping is concentrated, but we also have relatively high recharge. So a little bit of a, a, a different water balance situation, but still only 9% of annual recharge being used as groundwater pumping. And to summarize some of the habitat uh, and restoration recommendations, we found that the upper and middle reaches of Mill Creek and Lower Palmer appear to have the best overall conditions from various flow perspectives. Uh, we know from other data and studies that large wood and off-channel habitat are very limited in those reaches. So we think it makes sense to focus large wood and off-channel habitat enhancement projects in these reaches that have relatively good flow conditions um, where those projects can function in tandem with relatively good uh, stream flow availability. Uh, that helps narrow the focus of where uh, in-stream and off-channel enhancement work should occur. We also found that uh, much of the watershed, including Lower Mill, Lower Felta, and Wallace, have a uh, pretty questionable value as summer rearing habitat due to the very prolonged dry conditions in the spring and summer. And we also found that flows are somewhat problematic for spring out migration in the lowest reach of Mill Creek, uh, particularly in dry years with impassable conditions happening as early as mid-April, whereas we'd like to see uh, small out migrants be able to move out of the watershed through uh, late May or June. Uh, we also found some localized disconnection of surface flow in the middle reaches of mill kind of within that core habitat area and those are also somewhat problematic given their uh, proximity to where some of the best habitat in the watershed is. So I'm going to take a pause at this point to answer questions and have some discussion and then we'll move on to some of the strategies for enhancing flow conditions. Jeremy, this is Matt. Can you can you uh, say something about um, the extent of any available monitoring wells for calibration uh, in the upper watershed in the in the Franciscan bedrock? Yeah, that's a pretty easy one. It's uh, basically nil. We don't have any data whatsoever. We have static water levels from time of drilling. That's about it. And and does the uh, does the parameterization of the model in the Franciscan, is there any differences in, in the representation of the central belt portion of the Franciscan, which underlies most of Wallace Creek and the uh, coastal belt, which is pretty much the rest of the watershed? Not in terms of the subsurface. We do see a difference in the, the water balance, uh, mostly due to the different soil types and vegetation types that occur in those two terrains. Uh, we really are just very data limited in the Franciscan. Uh, we did look at a number of uh, pump tests in the Franciscan and didn't find any consistent relationships between aquifer properties and the different uh, units within the Franciscan. There's a lot of variability for sure, depending on the degree of fracturing. Uh, we're pretty data limited in our ability to, to represent that. So Jeremy, this is Mary. Um, you may not know the answer to this, but I'm just wondering, is there 
um, maybe Katie can answer. Is there an irrigation season where everybody turns on at the same time? Um, or are these mostly um, riparian um, rights where they withdraw all year? Um, I, I was just wondering um, if there's a way that things could be staggered or um, some way so everybody doesn't turn on at the same time. Yeah, I think there's definitely some potential for that. Um, the, the latter part of the presentation will look at the diversions in a scenario where we've turned off diversions to see which flow improvement could be had. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeremy, I have a, a follow up uh, to Mary's question, which is um, it, it, when you look at the, the watershed, um, you know, that, that lower portion that's pretty much out on the Dry Creek Valley floor is is really distinctively different in many ways from the upper watershed and um, how, how much uh, how disproportionate is irrigation use down in that part of the watershed compared to the upper watershed I guess with respect to like vineyard irrigation I don't have the numbers off the top of my head but it's definitely strongly concentrated in the lower watershed it's probably 10 times the demand in that lower watershed or upper watershed Certainly, the groundwater demand is heavily concentrated in that lower alluvial aquifer. Jeremy, there's a few questions uh, in chat, uh, which I'll read off. So the first was from uh, Tom Robinson, who's asking, uh, curious if you know if Coho used Wallace Creek at some point, and if so, do we know the cause of the current disconnection? And this may also be a question for uh, Krisha. Yeah, I have, I believe there's very few, if not no coho observations in Wallace in the recent time frame. I don't know historically. Um, I think it probably has a lot to do with the underlying geologic control of the uh, Central Belt Franciscan, uh, supporting more oak woodland and uh, drier vegetation and, and having a different soil signature than the watershed. There. Okay, um, and then the next question uh, from Jessica is asking, um, do the higher groundwater recharge locations correlate with where additional recharge would benefit stream flow? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say yes. Um, we're showing a pretty strong top of topographic control. So Low-lying uh, valley bottom areas or places where groundwater is discharging the stream. Uh, those aren't really the places where we'd expect uh, reach transmit to have a big effect. Uh, those aren't reach areas. So the yeah, the upland and uh, hill slope rains are, are where we think um, enhancement may may have more benefit. Uh, and then the next question from Andrew Rich is: Can you elaborate on how you simulated pool habitat? Uh, we did not simulate pool habitat, I guess, would be the short answer. We're, we're looking at um, a model that represents riffle crests. Uh, we know there are pools intervening between those riffle crests that are the important habitat areas, and we're using the flows and riffle depths, riffle crests as indicative of uh, what we expect. Okay, and then kind of a similar question from Sarah Nossman is, uh, can you speak to how you generated system-wide riffle depths uh, in various flow years? And how did you validate uh, or ground truth the model for that depth? Um, yes, uh, we have some excellent riffle depth data uh, that a gentleman named Brian Castle is working on out of UC Berkeley. Um, he's taken a number of uh, continuous riffle depth um, loggings as well as periodic measurements. We did some comparisons between our model simulated riffle depths and riffle depths that he observed uh, to try to understand uh, where those important thresholds were and also uh, validate the, the idea that our model is really representing conditions at riffle depths um, versus pool or anything else. Great. Um, I think that was it for the questions, unless anyone else. Oh, we have one more. Uh, so from uh, Daniel Grout, who's a landowner, um, is all the data pre-fire uh, and how will this data be useful for post-fire flow and recovery projects? Uh, what follow-up studies will be needed? 
Yeah, it's a good question. The obvious um, game changer was the, the Wallbridge fire uh, that happened about, I don't know, 80% of the way through our study. So we weren't really able to investigate the effects of that fire. Um, I think it would make sense to do so in a follow-up study. Uh, from what I know about uh, fire impacts and some of the observations that have been seen already, there may be some short-term benefits to stream flow. Uh, due to reduced transpiration following the fire. However, I think the long-term trajectory of that picture is very much in question. It uh, really depends on, on how much fire vegetation management happens. Um, so there may be a, a short-term uh, stream flow benefit that really changes the situation, but uh, in the long-term as the landscape recovers uh, may not look that different than, uh, but certainly worth more study in, yeah. This is Matt O'Connor. If I can just uh, add to uh, that response, um, the um, one thing that we really want to do this winter, but we don't really have any funding to do, is uh, to continue the stream flow gauging through the winter. Uh, Trout Unlimited uh, does a very good job of um, monitoring flows uh, along with Sea Grant in the uh, sort of spring and summer and, and late low flow season, but not the, um, not the winter peak flow season. And um, we're, we're, we'd love to find a, a, a way to, to fund that work um, as soon as possible. We, don't, we haven't come up with anything yet. Um, we'd, we'd also uh, benefit from some um, uh, post-fire uh, data, uh, the, um, the, the, the work reports um, provide some of that. There may need to be some additional data, but the, to, to do the modeling, one of the things we'd really need to know in better detail is sort of how extensive is the, is the stand damage? What, what's the extent of uh, tree mortality? Uh, that sort of information, I think, to really inform doing a, a, a model to evaluate the fire effects. But the, 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 uh, the flow response to the fire may be sort of a fleeting thing. So trying to get that on the ground is seems like the top priority. All right, it seems like it's time to move forward to the second half of the presentation. So here we're really focused on solutions. Uh, put this slide together to just kind of demonstrate our philosophy here. Um, you know, it's easy to get bogged down thinking about uh, constraints of projects, all the challenges, the costs, the regulatory hurdles, uh, end up looking like that guy on the left there, very, very obstacle focused. Uh, really at this high level planning uh, stage that we're at here, uh, we wanna stay in the middle, uh, focus on what actions can really make a difference uh, that's meaningful, stay solution focused, not get too bogged down in the details uh, however, we don't want to go all the way to the, the guy on the right there with his head in the clouds um, thinking uh, we can do things that are unrealistic. So that's kind of the philosophy behind the um, uh, laying out of the different scenarios we look at. So we looked at a number of scenarios. Uh, the first category are really water use scenarios. We wanted to understand what are the impacts of surface water divergence. Uh, simplest way to do that is simply turn them off in the model, see what happens. Same thing with groundwater pumping. Wanted to understand the cumulative impact of groundwater pumping, uh, turn those off in the model. Um, and then we can also look at a no water use scenario where we turn off all water use. Um, not to suggest that those are necessarily realistic, uh, are, are realistic goals. The idea is to see you know, how important are uh, diversions to the stream flow picture, how important is groundwater pumping. Uh, how much energy we invest in trying to do something about it. We also looked at flow releases. So this is the idea of looking at existing on-stream ponds um, as potential uh, storages of water for um, augmented stream flow. Uh, this is a strategy that's been used already in places like Porter Creek, uh, Dutch Bill Creek, and Green Valley Creek. Uh, we think it makes a lot of sense here in Mill Creek as well. Uh, there's different ways we can look at utilizing those um, existing storages, either for augmenting uh, spring out migration flows or for augmenting summer juvenile rearing base flow. Uh, we have the Healdsburg Wastewater Treatment Plant located just outside of our watershed on the downstream end there, um, which is a fantastic resource. Um, they are very, there's various ways we could look at 
using some of that recycled water. Uh, some of it already is being used um, either simply to offset groundwater pumping uh, through uh, use of water for irrigation or to look at using that water um, in a more beneficial manner for uh, reach or stream flow enhancement. Uh, we also looked at some combined scenarios where we combine uh, the different strategies together to see how, how good could we make conditions during the summer and uh, how good can we make conditions during the spring outflow period, out migration period. Uh, we'll be looking at climate change scenarios as well. We've done some preliminary work towards that, but don't have all of our results in yet for that. Uh, so this figure here is just to kind of clue you into a few locations where I'm going to be showing you some different stream flow hydrograph results. Uh, so we've got above Wallace Creek there, moving downstream, we've got above the falls, that's above that steep uh, volcanic reach, we've got below Felta, right below the Felta Creek confluence, and the upper part of the alluvial lower reach, and then we've got above Dry Creek at the very downstream. First category of scenarios we looked at were the water use scenarios. Here's our representation of where we have diversions of surface water. Uh, you can see those categorized as direct diversions, spring diversions, and pond diversions. Uh, also shown here are the various wells in the model, um, colored by well depth. We've got something like 60 surface water diversions and 210 groundwater wells. Um, in terms of the distribution, you know, they're really focused along the roadways, which essentially follow the stream channels, uh, more or less. Uh, we also see a pattern of increasing water use pressure and intensity as we move in the downstream direction. Um, we've got a number of surface water diversions kind of scattered throughout the watershed. Felt uh, maybe an exception with relatively small uh, diversion pressure on it. Uh, in terms of well depth, um, you know, wells up, up on ridge tops in the upper watershed are relatively deep, three, four hundred feet, shown in the dark blue, uh, anywhere uh, ranging down to relatively shallow near stream wells less than 50 feet. Um, many of the shallower wells seem to be in the lower watershed and relatively near stream. Uh, most of the wells down in the alluvium are in the 50 to 100 foot range. Um, that's because production on them is, is really so good that there's, there's just no reason to go any deeper than that. Uh, if we look at the impact of turning off all of the diversions in the model, um, we see a pretty significant short-term effect here. Uh, so we're looking at those two locations I showed you on the upper end, or kind of in the middle, middle reach, I guess you'd say, above Wallace and above the falls. And you can see that short-term complete disconnection of stream flow appears to be caused by uh, surface water diversions, at least in terms of how we've conceptualized it in our model. I will say that we've um, made some pretty conservative assumptions where, um, as Mary asked in her earlier question, we've assumed coincident timing of pumping, uh, not staggered pumping. Uh, so some of this might be able to be solved uh, simply by ensuring that uh, pumps are turning on at different times and different locations uh, to try to minimize that uh, short-term drawdown of stream flow that might be causing disconnection water quality issues. Uh, if we move farther downstream into the alluvial reach, you can see the diversion effect really goes away. So we've got this you know, really dry summer stream flow condition or reach and um, diversions are certainly not the cause of that. Uh, has more to do with kind of the regional water table in the Dry Creek Valley and uh, probably ongoing long-term incision of Dry Creek. Oh. Another way to look at the uh, effects of uh, turning off the divergence, uh, comparing the extent of where we see disconnection of surface flow and where flows remain connected. Uh, so existing on the top, no divergence in the bottom. We're looking at a dry year like 2014. Uh, if you notice the area I've circled there, um, we have this short-term disconnection happening in the middle reach. And much of that or most of it goes away when we turn off the surface diversions, suggesting that yeah, surface diversion pressure, at least in that middle reach, is uh, pretty substantial, might be causing some short-term uh, complete disconnection of Another way to look at that is to look at the mean summer discharge change. 
Uh, so now we're looking at that no divergence scenario I've been talking about on the top, and then the no groundwater pumping scenario on the bottom. Um, and you can see you know, fairly uh, modest reductions in stream flow or increases in stream flow when we turn the diversions off on the order of uh, 0.02 to 0.04 CFS in the middle reach. Uh, below Wallace Creek, we get up into the 0.04 to 0.06 range. Um, those are pretty small numbers, but that's something like 10 to 20% of the total stream flow. So definitely not insignificant. Uh, if we look at the groundwater pumping situation, uh, it's pretty different, really small effect. Uh, we see less than a um, hundredth of a CFS change in the average summer discharge, uh, all pumping in the entire river. But, um, that's not too surprising when we uh, go back and look at the water balance and realize that you know less than 1% of the infiltration discharge is being at bedrock terrain, uh, something like 9% in the lower terrain, in the alluvial aquifer. Um, and this next slide will demonstrate some of those effects in the alluvial aquifer. So we do see some decline in groundwater elevations down in the alluvium um, as a result of groundwater pumping, uh, but they're very modest. Um, here's two locations in that alluvial aquifer near stream, uh, looking at the March to October timeframe in 2018, which was pretty average water year. Uh, you can see the effect of turning off all the groundwater pumping was uh, couple tenths of a foot of change, and that mostly occurred in the uh, summer time frame when uh, flow has already gone to zero in this region. So, uh, the potential for stream flow depletion during that time is uh, pretty minimal since flows are so low and the effect drawdown in the aquifer is uh, Moving on to talk about pond releases as another potential flow enhancement strategy. We looked at all of the existing ponds in the watershed. We identified six that seemed to be the uh, most promising in terms of having enough storage to uh, be viable for a flow release. Um, also being located in a position in the watershed where they can make a difference. Uh, the total release volume we looked at was something like 95 acre feet per year. Uh, we looked at a variety of uh, different timing for releasing that water. There's of course an infinite number of possibilities here. Uh, we could focus on trying to augment juvenile habitat in the summer and look at a July through September release that would get it something like 0.36 CFS. Uh, we could also focus on trying to um, enhance out migration habitat and look at more of a May timeframe, shorter term spring release. Uh, we could get something like 1.6 CFS over a 21-day time frame in May. Um, then we could also look at optimizing those releases, and we found that uh, we really want to start them even earlier in a dry year, something like April 20th, and uh, that ramping flows over that spring time frame is a more effective solution for those results. Another important assumption, uh, we know there's a lot of concern about fire danger, we know some of these ponds are also being used for recreational purposes or other irrigation water uses, mostly for the small. Um, so we figure you know, it's not realistic to expect that all of the available pond storage should be used for release. We assumed half of it would be retained for fire suppression or other needs, and that half of it would be available for release. So to protect landowner confidentiality here, I'm not identifying the exact locations of the ponds. I'm showing you the locations where they at least would intersect the main stem of Wallace or Mill Creek. You can see the six releases and the total pond storage volumes available for release. Uh, so four of them are in Mill Creek, two are in Lower Wallace Creek. Um, you know, a lot of focus is right there, kind of on the Wallace Mill confluence in the middle. You can keep that in mind as we move forward with years. So if we look at above Wallace Creek and that summer release strategy, we can find, we see that we can make a substantial difference in stream flow at that location. Uh, we could probably eliminate or at least reduce the short-term disconnection due to surface divergence. We look a little farther downstream after all those releases come in, a substantial improvement in stream flow possible for water during the summer, uh, more than doubling the stream flow in that lower middle of the falls. Go farther downstream, 
kind of similar to the diversion picture. We're entering that losing alluvial aquifer reach. Our uh, summer releases are kind of a drop in the uh, alluvial aquifer bucket, if you will. Uh, don't make much difference if we get down there below Felt Creek. Certainly not as we get to the lowest reach below Dry Creek. The other way we can think about using uh, pond releases is to enhance out migration during the spring time frame. So here we looked at a 21 day constant release um, focused on the 21 days prior to that 80% out migration timing in mid late May. Um, pretty effective here. We can see above or below Felta Creek, we extended the out migration time frame where we had passable flows by uh, about 20 days. As we move down towards Dry Creek, where, where out migration is most limiting, uh, we only got about five days of flow improvement or of, of passable We also looked at optimizing the timing of those releases, and it turns out it makes a pretty big difference um, whether you start them early enough and you um, release the right amount of water at the right time. So because we have a declining hydrograph here, it makes sense to release water in a ramping fashion. Uh, so here we looked at um, getting the releases early enough, kind of right before we see disconnection above Dry Creek, and we looked at ramping those flows up from zero to 1.8 CFS over a 38 day time frame. Uh, probably it went a little too far with the time frame there. You can see we're just barely achieving or almost achieving our passage threshold, but we're achieving it for a much longer time frame. Essentially, able to maintain passable conditions continuously through that uh, third week of May time frame where we like to see that happen. So this illustrates the um, advantages to having you know, real-time stream flow monitoring, having an adaptive management plan, having the ability to um, control releases in a real-time fashion versus having sort of a management strategy where we uh, do a constant release at an established time frame. Moving on to the next category of flow enhancement. Um, this is a the example I wanted to show, just looking at recycled water use statewide in California. Um, recycled water use is becoming more and more of an important solution as climate change depletes water supplies more and more in the future. We'll see that happen um, increasingly. Uh, so the largest use of recycled water statewide is definitely for agricultural irrigation, and that's one that we investigated as well. Uh, but the second biggest use of recycled water is for groundwater recharge, um, and we also see groundwater increasingly being used for uh, restoration, wetland, and uh, stream flow enhancement. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got the Hillsburg Treatment Plant located nearby. We've got an existing uh, tertiary treated purple pipe down Foreman Lane in the lower alluvial reach. Uh, they're already delivering about 123 acre feet a year per year to various parcels. Uh, some of that is in Mill Creek itself. Some is, is uh, south of Watershed. Uh, there's 430 acre feet total available and the uh, treatment plant is uh, seeking uh, users for that. They're looking for solutions to deal with that um, supply of water in the summer. So it's a, a very good opportunity to see if there's things we could do with that that would improve stream flow and, and uh, some on habitat here. Uh, the most obvious thing, the most obvious use for that water would be to offset groundwater pumping with uh, irrigation. Uh, we find that in the lower alluvial reach, we've got about a, almost 200 acres of vineyard and four acres of pasture that could potentially use that recycled water. Uh, that would offset pumping by something like 85 acre feet per year. Um, sounds like a lot, sounds good, but as we saw in our no pumping scenario, relatively small stream flow benefits um, as a result of turning off all pumping in the entire watershed. So we don't really see the um, use of that recycled water for vineyard irrigation as a very good solution for stream flow enhancement. Uh, maybe, maybe reasons to want to do that besides flow enhancement, but uh, there may also be better ways we can make use of that. Uh, bringing us to the next point, which is uh, trying to use that recycled water 
as a means of enhancing stream flow and groundwater recharge. Um, this is a strategy that's not being done a lot locally, but is being done a lot regionally in, in California, particularly in Southern California. Um, there's various ways that water could be um, used to augment stream flow. Uh, we could have injection wells that waste the treated wastewater back into the groundwater system. Uh, we could have infiltration basins that essentially do the same thing, but maybe have some additional filtration advantages as the water moves through the unsaturated zone. And we have a lot of water potentially available to work with here. Uh, something like 500 gallons per minute continuously throughout that summer time frame, the spring time frame. Uh, if you want to think about that in CFS terms, that's about 1.1 cubic feet per second. So we're gonna be looking at an infiltration basin scenario. We haven't done that yet. The scenario we have looked at in terms of uh, using recycled water for flow augmentation is an injection well scenario. We looked at injecting the tertiary treated wastewater at two locations, one in the upper part of the alluvial aquifer near the Felta Creek confluence and one farther down closer to the Dry Creek confluence. I'm showing here the thickness of the alluvial aquifers. We've characterized it. Um, you can see there's some a substantial increase in thickness as we move downstream. So around the felt confluence in the upper part of the alluvial fan, we're only about 50 feet thick. As we move down towards Dry Creek, we get to the two, 300 foot thick part. Very different uh, aquifer situations uh, between the upper injection site and the lower injection site. And I'll just spoil the, the lower injection site results right now and say that uh, basically had no, no effect on uh, stream flow. Uh, the aquifer is too deep, the water table is too far below the stream bed to uh, make much difference on there. Um, however, we did see some promising results at our upper uh, injections. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's a lot of different ways this water could be um, injected or infiltrated. Uh, we looked at a simple scenario where we had three injection wells uh, taking that 500 gallons a minute evenly. They're spaced about 150 feet apart and they're also um, spaced at a distance of about 150 feet stream. So now we're looking at how the discharge changes as a result of that upper alluvial aquifer uh, treated wastewater injection. And the wastewater is um, mostly available during the May 15th to September 30th timeframe. This is when there's a prohibition on discharging wastewater to the Russian River, where the treatment plant would really like to see the water used. Um, however, it appears to be a little too late in the season to um, allow us to enhance stream flow enough to improve out migration, at least during a dry year like 2014. Um, so you can see we're, we're seeing a bump in stream flow, but it's not enough to give us passable uh, during that May-June timeframe. However, if we were to begin that wastewater injection a little earlier, time it to coincide with when flows disconnect above Dry Creek, um, in like April 20th in a dry year, um, we do see that it is enough of an effect to extend the out-migration timeframe uh, by between two and three weeks, um, which is uh, potentially um, very beneficial, allowing out migrants out of the watershed uh, during drought conditions. Uh, we can look at the effect on the water table as well. So this is looking at groundwater elevations um, uh, with the injection scenario. You can see we're keeping the aquifer much fuller during the June to October or June through September timeframe. Uh, when the injection is happening uh, up near the Felta confluence in the well field. As we move farther downstream, we see, yeah, the effect is you know, somewhat regional. It, it extends at least 2,000 feet downstream. Um, it diminishes, you might expect, but we're still seeing you know, a couple of feet of higher uh, water tables during the, the time frame, several thousand feet downstream of the injection site. Uh, we also lastly looked at a couple of scenarios where we combined strategies together, um, essentially trying to understand uh, how good could we make these summer flow conditions if we do the 
the things that seem to be most effective in combination. Uh, so summer flow, that's looking at um, replacing all of the direct and spring diversions of other sorts of water, as well as releasing water during the summer. And we can see a substantial benefit to the uh, summer stream flow. So in existing conditions during a dry year, and we're in the 0.1 to 0.3 CFS flow range in middle and low and, and middle mill uh, that can get bumped up to the 0.2 to 0.6 CFS flow range. We um, do both of those act. Most of the benefit happens kind of below Wallace Creek where we have many of the flow release happening. We don't see a lot of benefit um, in places outside of kind of our core habitat area. Not a lot of benefit in lower mill. Not a lot of benefit in places like walls. Uh, if we do everything we can to help the spring out migration picture, so that might be um, spring flow releases plus looking at the recycled water injection together, uh, you can see an you know, enormous uh, improvement in the spring flow condition. Uh, we can get achieved flows almost double what we need for providing out migration continuously. Uh, at least through that 80% out migration time frame in May. Um, and there's definitely some advantages here to um, you know, optimize the way we, we do these things. Um, if we did have injection plus flow releases, we might be able to use most of the flow releases during the summer and um, improve the out migration uh, situation primarily through injection of uh, recycled water. Uh, lastly, there's other flow enhancement strategies. Um, we're not looking at these currently in this particular study, but we have looked at all three of these listed here in Mark West Creek in a parallel study that we just finished. Uh, these are things like uh, forest management, obviously a lot of interest for this, uh, for reduced fire risk, uh, but also potentially some reduction in the demand of forest on transpiration and thus some stream flow enhancement benefits. Uh, of course, the wall breach fire is expected to have a big impact, at least in the short term, on poor conditions in the watershed. Uh, we also looked in Mark West Creek at uh, applying compost to grasslands as a means of enhancing recharge and sequestering carbon. And then we looked at managing runoff um, as a means of uh, enhancing recharge. All three strategies uh, we showed had a kind of a modest uh, distributed benefit on stream flow in Mark West Creek. Um, we would expect some, uh, not necessarily game changers, but, but other means of uh, making modest improvements in stream flow. Uh, the final category of scenarios I'm going to touch on are the climate change scenarios. We haven't ran these yet in Mill Creek, but we have um, in that Mark West study. Uh, we're looking at four different scenarios um, representing a range of potential future climates. Uh, this figure here shows the, the projected change in temperature and precipitation on an annual basis. Uh, pretty wide variability in what those models predict. Um, they all say it's going to be warmer, uh, very depending on uh, the emission scenarios, depending on uh, how much warmer. Um, a lot of variability in precipitation. Some scenarios are saying drier overall. Some are actually seeing wetter overall in our area. However, if we look at the um, commonalities in the predictions between the different models, uh, they're all showing an increased seasonality precipitation. So less precipitation in fall and spring and more in winter. Um, this, we believe, has big ramifications for the um, smoke out migration picture and the springtime flow picture. Uh, if we look here at the predictions of those models for the Mill Creek watershed uh, relative to existing conditions in black, you'll see all four scenarios, even those that say more rainfall overall, say less rainfall during the March, April, May, June timeframe. Um, our work in Mark Creek suggests that um, springtime flows will substantially and that'll have a big impact on um, out migration. We expect to um, similar Mill Creek once we run those. So to summarize the scenarios, uh, we found that surface water diversions may be resulting in short-term disconnection of surface flow in portions of Mill Creek, but probably not in lower Mill Creek. 
Uh, we found that groundwater pumping impacts on stream flow were pretty minimal overall. Uh, we found summer pond releases are a very effective strategy for enhancing summer stream flow, but again, not enough to make much of a difference in lower milt and that losing alluvial reach. Spring pond releases can significantly improve out migration conditions in the lower reach. Um, and we see some major benefits to making sure that those are paired with real-time stream flow monitoring and adaptive management. Um, if we sort of uh, blindly release water, uh, we may not get the benefits we want to see. If, however, we optimize those and adaptively manage them, we can begin them when we need to, ramp them up the way um, they need to, to be optimized um, and get the maximum benefit. Um, we see reuse of recycled water, um, either through infiltration, uh, which we will be investigating, or through injection, is in a strategy that can significantly improve the out-migration flow situation in lower mill. However, the uh, injection or infiltration needs to happen in the upper alluvial aquifer, upper portion of the alluvial aquifer, where uh, the alluvial materials are relatively thin, and we can hope to manipulate conditions as we move Farther towards the lower end and Dry Creek, um, things are really controlled by the regional picture in the base flow in Dry Creek, and it's much more difficult to uh, manipulate the aquifers in a meaningful manner. Uh, final slide on overall recommendations. Uh, we helped identify uh, the core habitat areas in Mill Creek that have um, the flow conditions needed to support multiple life stages for salmonids or salmonids. This really helps us uh, focus future enhancement efforts to happen in these core areas. Um, let's make conditions as good as we can in these uh, key refugia areas. Uh, we know from other work that large woody debris and off-channel habitat are pretty limited uh, throughout the system. So those types of projects make sense, prioritized in those core areas. Uh, we see pond releases as really the low-hanging fruit um, you know, more, more than any other strategy, pond releases provide us an ability to adaptively respond to um, hydrologic conditions from year to year and to climate change. Uh, of course, they're not without their challenges. Um, there's uh, several hurdles, such as landowner willingness, uh, the need to maintain temperature control in those releases, uh, water rights considerations, and other, other things to think about as well. Uh, direct diversion seem to be having a significant impact on stream flow, so we'd like to see uh, those replaced where possible, um, or, or um, summer diversion, um, uh, deferred, in, you know, winter diversion, diversion and storage happening in lieu of summer diversion. Uh, recycled water for recharge and flow enhancement seems to have a lot of promise. Um, there's a lot more work to be done before something like that could happen. Uh, we think a feasibility study makes sense. It understands some of the water quality ramifications, uh, costs and, and so forth associated with moving forward with that. Um, the fire is a big deal. Um, we think post-fire extreme flow monitoring is very important. We have an opportunity here to uh, understand the fire effects on stream flow through the monitoring that's been happening and continuing to happen. Uh, we also see the stream flow monitoring as being key to adaptive management in terms of the pond releases. And we think additional work on post fire and forest management, uh, hydrologic effect, a lot of sense here as well. Going. And I'll leave you with a winter base flow picture of Middle Mill Creek. So uh, this is Kevin jumping in here. Uh, if folks do have questions for Jeremy, can you please type them uh, in the chat? I just want to make sure we have enough time for Krisha's presentation because we're running, uh, you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes behind here. So um, please type your questions in the chat and Jeremy, feel free to answer those as you come to them. Otherwise, we'll have a Q&A at the very end uh, once Krisha is done. Um, so Krisha, go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, so... My name is Krisha Skorko, and I'm going to discuss the monitoring that Trout Unlimited has been doing um, in the lower portion of Mill Creek. And we've been, we're in our third year now of this study, and I'm going to discuss the surface and groundwater interactions in a little bit more detail and um, really dig into some of the data 
that's coming out of the watershed. An outline for uh, this talk. First, we'll give a summary and background of TU's work in Mill Creek to date and go over the motivations and methods for this lower Mill Creek study. I'll give a hydrologic context for water year 2018 through 20. Um, this is the, the years we've been monitoring down in the lower part of the watershed. I'll jump into a discussion of surface stream flow and groundwater levels in 2020 and compare those to measurements we've taken in previous years. And I'll discuss gaining and losing reaches and then some conclusions and takeaways. So uh, just some background, Trout Unlimited, formerly CMAR, has been monitoring in the upper Mill Creek watershed since 2010. And we currently operate seven stream flow gauges in the watershed. And the data coming out of our studies have been used to inform water storage projects, used to increase water security and benefit coho salmon and steelhead trout. And some other uses of the data um, as uh, Jeremy went into detail, groundwater modeling done by OEI. Um, the data is also used for fish monitoring done by Sea Grant, including over the site of a former fish passage barrier. And SF State has also used our data for a relationship between fog, water temperature, and stream flow. So again, this is a map of the Mill Creek watershed. So Mill Creek flows from uh, west to east. And uh, today we'll really be focusing on this lower alluvial portion of the watershed. But we do have several gauges in the upper portion of the watershed. These uh, two green dots are our surface water gauges in the lower alluvial reach. And we also have some data from existing groundwater wells. Going over the motivations for the Lower Mill Creek study. Um, as Jeremy, men Jeremy mentioned, Lower Mill Creek flows through a fluvial alluvial fan, which is defined as a triangular fluvial depositional feature, which is gently, gently sloped and composed of very porous material. And this can be a known challenge for flow augmentation work. Uh, as we saw in the last presentation, this is a very dry section of the reach. It goes dry in dry years, and we'll um, see that later um, with the data that I'll show. And there's been concern about small outmigration in May uh, due to the low flow in this section. So um, again, we're wondering if there's anything that resource managers can do to increase flow and connectivity in this reach. And surface groundwater interaction data can help provide answers to this question. Water year 2020 was the third year of this study. Um, again, we're trying to better understand the interactions between surface and groundwater here. And uh, the results will be another tool in helping resource managers understand how um, water augmentation projects um, can be used in this reach. So what's new in 2020 in our third year of the study? The data um, were collected starting in the spring of 2018 and continued through the 2020 dry season. And I'll be talking about our 2020 data in the context of the other three years of data as well. Fieldwork was able to continue through implementation of new safety protocols developed this year surrounding COVID-19. And in terms of rainfall, 2020 was certainly a low precipitation year comparable to the drought years that we saw um, in the mid 2010s. So our methods for this study, we have two surface water gauges and one groundwater continuous well in the lower portion of Mill, Reach, or Mill Creek. And these were installed in March and April of 2018 and maintained through 2020. We took um, monthly manual groundwater level measurements at eight of the existing wells. Um, this was done by SRCD as well as some by TU. Uh, 
and we collected monthly stream flow measurements from uh, during the dry season from roughly uh, May to June um, and then through late October of each dry season from 2018 to 2020. And a total station survey was conducted to tie the surface water and groundwater data together. I wanted to give some hydrologic context to the three years that we're focusing on for this study. Um, this plot shows total annual rainfall from the re recorded at the NCDC station number 3875 in Healdsburg. And I'm showing years 2010 through 2020 because these are the years that we've been uh, studying in the Mill Creek watershed. Again, I'll be focusing on years 2018, 2019, and 2020. I have two averages plotted on this, uh, on this plot as well. The upper one is the long-term average taken from this station. Uh, data goes back, I believe, to the 40s. So this is the, the long-term annual precipitation. And I've also plotted the average over the 11 year period that we're looking at. So we can see that the past 11 years have been quite a bit drier than the long-term average. And years 2018 was one of the driest years um, that we've seen recently, comparable to the drought years. 2019 was wetter. It was um, above the short-term average, still below the long-term average. And then 2020 was another very dry year. The plot above shows the uh, daily rainfall recorded at the Healdsburg station over water year 2020. We can see that we got most of our precipitation um, in December. It was one larger storm. It was somewhat wet from December through January. And uh, we had quite a dry February this year. And a little bit of extra rain coming in in April and then um, May. The plot below shows the monthly precipitation as compared to the long-term average in each month. So just another way of visualizing what the water year was like. Um, again, whoops, sorry about that. Um, most rainfall, uh, the rainfall in most months was below average, except for May. We had an above average uh, May this year. Sometimes that can help prolong stream flows as we start getting into the dry season. This is a similar plot that shows the, again, the monthly average precipitation, uh, this time with all three water years plotted. And um, I'm just showing this to give you a sense of the variability that we can see in this area. Um, you might have some very wet months and some very dry months, and it uh, can change a lot month to month and year to year. So now I'm going to get into the surface and groundwater data um, from 2018 to 2020. First, I wanted to show you um, a map of where we're collecting these data. So to orient you, this is uh, Mill Creek crossing West Side Road. This is what we're calling the lower portion of Mill Creek. Um, it comes down and intersects Dry Creek here. So we have um, one continuous groundwater well, which is LMO1, up in the upper portion of the reach. A little further downstream, we see LMO2. This is our most upstream surface water gauge. LMO3 is our most downstream surface water gauge. And then all of the white callouts um, are pointing to uh, existing groundwater wells that we collected data from for this study. I'd like to start by talking about the surface water flow um, over the course of the dry season. So this is 15 minute stream flow data at both our LMO2 gauge, which is upstream and our LMO3 gauge, which is slightly downstream. You can see in the map in the corner. So this shows the, um, the stream flow from May 1st um, through when it dries out the green line is the upper gauge, LMO2. The blue line is the lower gauge, LMO3. 
we can see that we saw discharge starting out pretty low at this point in the dry season. We did see a couple of small peaks in response to those May rain events. Um, throughout the spring, the upper portion of the channel uh, has slightly higher stream flow than the lower portion. This relationship reverses in about early June. And we see that the upstream gauge dries out uh, quite early this year in about late June. And the lower gauge managed to hold on to stream flow a little bit longer and dries out in uh, about mid-July. Um, but we can see it's, um, these flows are quite low throughout this time period. This next plot gives that low stream flow and a little bit more context of the past three years. This plot shows our three years of monitoring data from LMO2, our upstream gauge. Uh, the black line here shows the data that I just showed plotted against the two hydrographs from the previous years, water year 2018 and 2019. 2018 was a dry year as well. We can see that flows um, receded in a similar manner to this year, dried out in about mid-July. Water year 2019 was the wettest year of our study and we saw flows holding on to, until early September at this site. And again, 2020 was the driest year with uh, flows disconnecting in mid to late June. This is a plot of three years of hydrograph data from our LMO3 downstream gauge. We can see once again that water year 2018 and 2020 were both um, quite low in comparison to water year 2019. In water year 2020, we managed to hang on to the stream flow a little bit longer, slightly uh, more as, it, as we did in 2018. And uh, in 2019, flows persisted through early October. This is our first look at the continuous groundwater data that we've been collecting at that LMO1 upstream continuous well. This also shows three years of groundwater data. So um, instead of having stream flow on the y-axis here, we have elevation that shows the level of the groundwater. Um, with our survey, we were able to uh, tie it in and convert it to elevation above mean sea level. And we're showing the dry season, March through November on this plot. We see that um, we can look at 2020 and go back in time. So 2020, our driest year, we saw uh, a recession of groundwater starting at about um, early July, and then it starts to plunge really deeply um, after that. And we saw our lowest groundwater levels of the study um, in this past few months. 2018, also a dry year, started out pretty similar to, um, we can see it's pretty similar to 2020 in the um, spring and early summer. It also drops off pretty steeply as the dry season goes on. And 2019, our wettest year, we see that um, groundwater is consistently higher in this year than in other years, and it doesn't drop off, doesn't do that um, late season drop quite as dramatically as we see in the dry years. Um, I wanted to revisit the site map because um, it's useful to look at these data uh, in rough transects from upstream to downstream. So I've connected lines between our data points in four transects, transect one, two, three, and four and I'll plot these data against each other in the next few slides. So this is um, data from our up, most upstream sites, transect one from water year 2018 to 2020. We can see on the map that this transect is composed of unused well one, which is also LMR1, our continuous groundwater well, 
and the driveway well, which is further out on the floodplain. And just to orient you a little bit to the data that we're looking at, the continuous blue line is the continuous groundwater data from that LM01 well. The red lines are spot, or the red squares, excuse me, are spot measurements. And the green triangles are spot measurements taken at the driveway well. So uh, our data here are running from March of 2018 when we installed the gauges. We see a recession through the dry season down to about uh, late November when we see the uh, quick rise in groundwater levels due to the rains coming in. Water year 2019, this, uh, these peaks here represent the um, rise and fall of the groundwater level in response to rain events in our one wetter year, water year uh, 2019. Another recession, but we can see that the groundwater doesn't drop nearly as low um, at these sites as it did in the previous year or in the following year, which is 2020. Uh, here we see the um, smaller peaks from our 2020 rain events, a slow recession, and then a steep drop off to the lowest groundwater level um, of the study in November of 2020. Moving slightly downstream to transect two, this is the, uh, a transect that's composed of our upstream surface water well, LMO2, as well as the TP well, which is a groundwater well that's uh, very close to the channel, and then the winery well, which is further out on the floodplain. The orange line um, is surface water elevation. So we can see after the installation, we get one storm, a little peak, a recession, and then when the, uh, when the gauge pool dries, um, that's, that's represented by the gap in the line. And we see, um, again, groundwater is, um, well, actually what's a little bit different here is that the groundwater just slightly downstream um, is slightly more disconnected from the surface water. Or I guess yeah, it, it's slightly disconnected from the surface water. And we can see also that it does these steep drops after the, ground, after the surface water dries out. It rebounds when the surface water rebounds. Again, we see a recession in the uh, fall of 2019. However, the flow hangs on for quite a bit longer than 2018. And then we see another recession uh, in 2020. And we don't have data that extends quite far out into the fall at these sites, but I suspect that we would see groundwater levels getting quite low here as well. Moving downstream again, this is Transect 3. It's composed of LMO3, our downstream surface water gauge, as well as the house well, um, which is further out on the floodplain. And this is getting further downstream into the deeper into the alluvial reach, where um, the, as we can see here, the surface water is very disconnected from the groundwater. It's about 15 feet below the surface water um, at all points during the year. We have um, a short period of flow in 2018. We actually had a gauge washout at this site. So the brown dash line, I'm, I'm substituting um, adjusted data from our upstream gauge here just to give you a sense for what's happening in the time period. Um, interestingly, and I don't think we had um, boots on the ground to confirm this, but it doesn't appear that the gauge dried out in 2019. So we don't see this little drop um, that we saw in other years. We see the small peaks from uh, flow, from increased flow in the winter of 2020. 
And again, a slow recession after that. And moving downstream once more, this is transect floor, which is uh, furthest towards Dry Creek. And this transect is, we don't have a surface well this far down, so we're just looking at two groundwater wells. And what's interesting about this plot is we see that the unused well, which is out on the floodplain, um, compared to the Abbey well, which is near the channel, um, the Abbey well uh, gains water, or the, um, yeah, the Abbey well gains water from the floodplain here, presumably, and we see increased um, groundwater farther out into the floodplain that we don't see near the channel. And we're presuming that this is because we're far enough downstream to be in that influence of the Dry Creek aquifer. Um, I wanted to show you these data in a slightly different way. This is the upstream surface and groundwater well level. So the dark blue line represents the continuous LMO1 groundwater data. And it's plotted against the uh, closest surface water gauge, which is LMO2. And we can see again this pattern of higher groundwater in the spring and summer, a recession in the dry fall of 2018, much less of a drop in uh, 2019. And then again, this uh, deep drop in uh, November of 2020. And I've also plotted on here the, um, the dates at which the stream channel dries out. So we can see, and we looked at this a little bit before with the hydrographs, uh, but it's interesting to see when the channel dries out, what that does to the groundwater when it's presumably not recharging anymore we can see that usually, typically, right after the drying date um, is when we really start to see the, uh, the groundwater start dropping. So I'm going to show these data again and think about it in the context of gaining and losing reaches. So the question we're trying to answer is, uh, how do uh, water levels in and near the channel compared to those on the floodplain. So again, this is transect one, which shows our continuous groundwater well as compared to the driveway well further out on the floodplain. And we can see that in this upstream reach, we the channel, the near channel well does gain water from the floodplain early in the spring and the summer. But this relationship reverses um, as the dry season goes on and then the channel starts, the floodplain starts um, gaining water from the channel instead. And uh, this relationship does break down a little bit in water year 2020. Um, maybe the channel, the near channel well receded faster um, this year. So we see that relationship reversed a little bit in the dry season, but uh, in general, um, the channel gains water from the floodplain and becomes in the spring and becomes losing in the summer. Slightly downstream in transect two, um, and this is not too much further downstream, we see that the channel loses water to the floodplain year round. Um, we see that starting out as soon as we um, installed our gauges in March of 2018. We see that the uh, well adjacent to the channel as well as further out in the floodplain starts to become uh, disconnected from that uh, surface water level. And again, this is the further downstream we go, um, the more dramatic this relationship becomes, where again, we have these uh, surface water perched well above the groundwater level uh, throughout the year. Uh, and this shows, this shows that um, kind of interesting relationship again between gaining and losing in the furthest downstream wells with 
the dry re the uh, dry creek influencing the well further out in the floodplain. So um, to summarize and add some takeaways, this study took place um, over three years that included a dry year, a wetter year, followed by another very dry year. And uh, future funding uh, may allow us to gauge in more of a variety of years. We might see a very wet year or more of an average year in the future. And we can see that the uh, both the ground and the surface water here are highly affected by the amount of annual precipitation. Um, there doesn't have a long memory here. Uh, when we have dry years, we see low groundwater levels in higher and wetter years, and it seems like that can change um, very quickly depending on the kind of winter that you get. Uh, surface water flows were lowest in water year 2020 and highest in water year 2019. However, the pools can hold water in the weeks following disconnection. And again, the groundwater levels were also lowest in water year 2020 and highest in water year 2019. And in all years, um, most of the channel loses water to the floodplain year round. And I think this gets into the question of, you know, what can we do to augment flow when we have this uh, system that's losing water? And especially when groundwater levels in the lowest reaches are about 15 feet below the channel bottom, starting in late spring. Um, however, we see that flows in wet years can actually persist through the fall in that reach. So I think that gives us some room for optimism, especially as we start talking about, um, you know, the realities of flow augmentation projects. I think that um, there is still you know, um, some room for optimism about the lower reach, uh, especially in wetter years. But, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, maybe it would have to be uh, part of this adaptive management uh, mentality where you're monitoring that quite closely and um, thinking about how you could um, best improve that situation in the downstream reach. And according to Sea Grant research, fish, fish can survive in disconnected pools for approximately two weeks in alluvial channels. And I think, again, in the wetter year, we actually saw a, a pretty short period of disconnection. So some room for optimism there as well. Um, as despite being perched above the uh, groundwater, maybe some flow augmentation could benefit uh, this reach, and especially in the upstream reach where it's not as disconnected. Um, that is all. Does anybody have any questions? People might be typing now. Um, and I, I encourage folks to uh, email us if you do have questions that you think of later. Um, and we can always we can always respond to you by email after the fact. Um, I just also want to remind folks that uh, we are recording this presentation, so it will be available to view uh, afterwards. And we'll post a link on uh, the RCD website um, and probably do a e blast about it as well. Um, I'll wait a couple more minutes if folks are still typing. This is Matt O'Connor. I, I have a question, and, and, and that's just, um, Christian, can you just um, discuss briefly uh, the, the, the fact that um, you, you see pretty consistent uh, groundwater elevations at which the uh, stream flow disappears from the stream and goes subsurface, but those groundwater elevations uh, at least in most of the graphics, are below the elevation of the stream bed. And I, I just wonder what you're thinking about that is. Oh, sure. So I think that's just an artifact of our um, continuous groundwater well that we show a lot in this presentation being slightly downstream of the, ah. uh, or slightly upstream of that surface water. Uh, okay, so does that answer the question? Uh, it, 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 it could very well answer the question. I just wonder if there was something 
different going on there, but yeah, that, that could be, uh, that could explain that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, if, it, if the, if the well was like immediately adjacent to where the, the stream gauge was, you, you would at least, ex you might expect those things to be pretty much the same elevation. Yes, I, I believe so. I, I don't think they'd necessarily have to be, but, um, mm -hmm. but that yeah, I don't think, very good. Yeah, that's something I forgot to mention. Yeah, I think that that is what explains that bit of offset. And I think that because of how responsive the groundwater is to the surface water, I think that, um, yeah, if we saw them side by side, we would see them matching up pretty equally. Yeah, and, 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 and since, uh, um, since we're looking at this graphic about, uh, you know, how, how bad this year is in terms of low stream flows, I, I know we've been out on a lot of different places this year and kind of shocked to see how low the flows are. And you know, this hasn't been, you know, we, we thought we got it really bad when we had the drought from 2013 through 2014 through 2015. And, and now it seems like the, the flows are even worse this year after a couple of good rainy years in, in three. Mm -hmm. And you, you're seeing that in other places in, in the region that you work in too as well. Yes, yes, we've um, definitely been seeing that all over. Um, 2020, I guess, that's all you can say. <laughs> right, 2020. <laughs> Um, there's one more question uh, from Sarah Nossman, who's uh, was asking Jeremy, uh, did you only look, uh, or sorry, did you, yeah, did you only look at all six ponds collectively when you were looking at those impacts, or did you think there would be some potential benefit um, from, uh, you know, just maybe getting a few pond owners on board with, with releases? Yeah, we haven't looked at that at this point, but I certainly think it makes sense to do so. Um, it was kind of the maximum build out of everybody on board. But, um, from what we've seen so far, I think there would definitely be benefit from less, less than everybody on board. All right, well, it looks like that might be it uh, for the questions. But again, you know, feel free uh, to email us if you, if you do come up with questions later on um, and we can respond to those uh, via email. Um, otherwise, you know, thank you for your time tonight. I know it's not easy to attend an evening meeting that's two hours long, but I really appreciate um, everyone participating in the meeting. Hopefully it was uh, informative for you guys, and we definitely look forward to bringing you, you know, the final uh, report, which will be hopefully early uh, next year. Um, but, you know, the RCD is continuing to, to look for funding sources, you know, to potentially continue monitoring work and and, you know, potentially get uh, additional funding for uh, additional modeling work as well for, for OEI. I think we would really like to see, you know, a post-fire analysis. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can find um, a suitable funding source for that in the future. Um, and with that said, I think we'll, we'll end it there. Uh, again, thanks everyone for attending and uh, take care. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.